the first part will be the presentations a more traditional if I may say, the presentations of our speakers. Um, and then we will have a moderated discussion led by my, my colleague Rachel, uh, Paying Communications Manager of ISCA, where uh, we will have your, answer, uh, your questions presented to the uh, speakers and we hope that we give you the answers. So without uh, much ado, um, I'm very happy to also present you our amazing panel with experts representing different organizations. Here with us, we have Game and Simon and Marie. Uh, and Game is a Danish NGO founded in 2002 with a mission to create lasting social change through youth-led street sport and culture. With us are Simon, who is the co-founder and the CEO, and we have Marie, she is heading uh, the head of innovation and programming in game, and she works with engaging um, youth in physical activities in urban space, and also um, as uh, games work with a human-centered particip participatory design as an approach to developing both facilities and activities. Then we have with us, and guys, uh, when you hear your name, just raise your hand so people know you are. Then we have Ramon. Uh, Marades from Spain. Um, uh, Ramon Marades is an urban economist and activist turned a creative bureaucrat and placemaker. He is currently the chief strategy officer at La Marina de Valencia, Valencia's waterfront redevelopment agency and a board member of Placemaking Europe. And Ramon also represents Placemaking Europe tonight at this uh, uh, webinar. And Placemaking Europe is a non-for-profit organization connecting actors uh, to make public places great using placemaking throughout Europe. Then we have with us Jeff Rizum from Gale. And Gale as an organization focuses on the relationship between the built environment and the people's quality of life. Gale is based in Copenhagen, New York and San Francisco, and their aim is to create cities for people. Gale is also a global urban research and design consultancy. Jeff, on his side, is the chief innovation officer at Gale, leading a team dedicated to service development and applied innovation. His focus is on the relationship between human experience and design and works to apply first design principles to communal ecosystems such as streets, public space, food systems and energy. And we, the host, the International Sport and Culture Association, we are a global platform open to organizations working within the field of sport for all, recreational sports and physical activity. This year we have our 25th anniversary because we were created back in 1995. Um, and we are very happy that for these 25 years, we are closely cooperating with more than 250 member organizations, international NGOs and public and private sectors and stakeholders. And from ISCA, a part of me, we have our president, Morgan Kirkeby, and Rachel Payne, our communications manager. And Rachel is a journalist and academic with PhD in sports journalism, and she will be moderating our discussion. So I hope that with this presentation, um, I can give directly the rights to Mogens to present uh, the human right to move, an ISCA concept that we created um, maybe two years ago. Mogens? Thank you very much. I will uh, speak about the human right to move or actually, sorry, here we go, the human right to move in a after COVID situation. Because uh, as you have noticed, there has been a small story, we can call it uh, COVID, and uh, it has uh, actually infected us in many ways and also affected us in other ways. Uh, I would claim that uh, most citizens lost this human right to move during the last few months. And uh, 
the question is whether we will get it back uh, or who will get it back and what will we get back and of course uh, when uh, is the human right to move or the accessibility to, to move the access to facilities, spaces, activities, is it lost forever or is it just momentarily while we have this uh, little uh, intruder called COVID-19? A few things about human rights uh, perspective, the fundamental human rights, there are three key players. There is the, the duty bearer, the one that should deliver, that's normally the state, the society. And uh, then depending on what topic it is, let's say we are in sport and physical activity, then there are also moral duty bearer. In this case, it's, for example, sport organization, game, and others who say, we, we would like to provide uh, sport and physical activities, so we, we check in as a moral duty bearer. And then there is, of course, the, the right holder, the citizen, and uh, they also have a duty, a duty to, so to say, act and to take what uh, they can uh, to assess this uh, right. It's not something that we feed the citizen with, but we give the citizen the possibility to be, to be active. There are different uh, elements of these uh, duty bearers and right holders uh, that can help uh, us to have the human right to move or to access it. And that can be economy, it can be structure, it can be REITs, and for the holders, right holders, the citizens, it's, it's everything that you know of, motivation, cost, attitude, and time. Just a few things, what we saw already, the COVID-19 implications on the sports sector, because it's clear, it's there, we can already see what it is, we don't know how long it will last, and what will, so to say, go away. But there could be three areas, uh, the general implications, some of the national elements, and then the providers, the organizations, whatever, those who provide the actions. And uh, on the general implications, it's clear this is economic downturn, there will be political changes, many of us feel this psychotic thing, and of course we are also not able to move uh, even some of us has to stay uh, at home. So these are short, short and long-term implications very, very fast. The national rules, you all know them. Some are in lockdown, some are opening. There were assembly limitations and also where to go. So there were immediate major changes in the different countries. For the operators, the providers, they try to adapt and we've seen many, many different things. Now they have to adapt to reopening sessions, phases, whatever it's called around the world. But they have also faced this missing customer member relation and uh, seen a lot of uh, offline action going online. So they try to fast adapt, but there will probably be very long term consequences. If you look at the human right to move and the obstacles for the human right to move, a number of these issues will affect that. And Mark to be read here and that there might be others, but we don't know how, but they will probably affect our possibility to sort of say cash in the human rights to move. Another perspective is that the public health, the individual health perspective, have always been a good carrier of the message for the human right to move. Many of you have argued that the reason we should do that, sponsor that, is because it will help us uh, to a better life healthier life and public health. But the problem is public health today means only COVID-19. It's taking the front pages, taking anything out of the equation. This is the formal medical ranking because here we have the leading global death risk and the physical inactivity, which is related to the opposite part, the sport and the activity has uh, this not so fancy, but in an advocacy sense, good position, fourth uh, leading death risk, 6%. So this has been a good carrier of the message and when we have to convince people to, so to say, help the system. But today, the public ranking is different. The political ranking is completely different. It's everything is about viral diseases and physical activity is way 
out of the agenda. A few things uh, about uh, the position of uh, sport and physical activity in the community perspective and the political perspective. We have this fear versus social hunger. Will it be stay at home or togetherness that wins? We don't know. We have a strong focus on personal health, but will it be face mask or sports shoes that wins? Then we see in the future there will be a lot of indoor activities with warning signs and outdoor is more freedom. So what will win? We don't know. Voluntarism in local community has uh, increased in many ways, but will it be in our sector? We don't know. The political authority has another agenda. It's about avoid the virus, protect the health system. Individual immune system has been important, but there was no time to speak how to improve that. Physical activity and good health is good for that, but it has not been an agenda. Again, here you can say the health sector, the white heroes, uh, the white sector is heroes, and cure come for, before prevention again. Everything is about vaccine, physical health, not so much social and mental health. So, this is my personal political ranking. I think on one side, we still have the medical ranking, physical activity or physical inactivity is still the fourth leading. And COVID, if let's say half a million died, we are not there yet it will not rank very high. But that's a political discussion. But the political ranking is uh, for sure, physical activity is not on the agenda. So in very short, the human right to move will lose big time to COVID-19 because the attack hits us on a broad range of elements. The accessibility, we will hear more about where that could be, the organizational infrastructure, those who provide, they are hit. Many will not survive this uh, situation. Then we have the psychological factor. Is fear going to stay and how much will it? For the different target group, for example, the seniors, uh, elderly people, will they be afraid to participate in social sport and social activities? We don't know, but for sure it will influence the way you can access your right to move. Economy at individual level and also national and municipal level, which is strong support of these activities will be hit. We don't know how much it will uh, suffer the sector. And then again, I said advocacy is also, uh, we are out of the agenda for the moment. So in very short, uh, we need to be very creative to get back in the playing field. Thank you. Thank you, Morgens. Um, and with being very creative and before giving the word to Jeff, I would like to ask you to answer two questions uh, for us and I will launch a poll and you will have 60 seconds to answer that one. So here we start. Okay. Oh, 50-50. Okay. You have 10 seconds more. And I'm closing. And here are the results. Okay, to the first question. If your city was locked down, have you used public space during the pandemic while your city was on a lockdown? Yes. 58% no, 43%. Okay, thank you. And I have the second question to you now. Okay, I'm launching that one. Wow, big difference. Okay, I'm closing the poll now and I share. 
So it seems public space parks or streets have been closed in all, almost all of our cities that we are coming from. And with this result, uh, Maria, could you please give the presentation rights to Jeff so he can start his presentation? Jeff? Yeah, can you see it there? We don't see your presentation. Can you share? It says that I'm showing. Uh, not showing anything. Okay, show my Aha. screen. You're on. I'm on. Okay, great. So thank you all for joining and also for answering those two questions. Um, definitely interesting that there was some difference uh, between the two. And Laska, did most everyone respond or that percentage is about how many people responded? I'm curious. Just give me a second to check. 62% voted for the first one. Yeah. And uh... For the question one, 66% voted. Okay, so super interesting. And I think I'm you know, calling in from Denmark as Laska mentioned. And what's been interesting here is that actually the city, um, streets and spaces and public life have been pretty active, uh, active part of the country's response to the pandemic. So I think there's been a national support to be outside, get exercise and fresh air, meet people, but do so responsibly and by following physical distancing rules. And I think that is very interesting to ponder, maybe something we'll talk about later, um, how the Danish approach might be similar or different to other countries. Uh, but for me, of course, working as an urban designer, I feel like right now, uh, our built environment, our, our neighborhoods, our streets and our spaces are actually one of the best tools that we have to deal with this pandemic and deal with our health uh, because we don't have a, a virus, a, a vaccine or a pill that we can take, right? So the best thing that we can do also to Moans's point is uh, take good care of our ourselves. And so it'd be interesting to see how we can not promote that um, and not fall into the trap that uh, that Moans was saying. But I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here in terms of all of you guys uh, feeling that way. But hopefully what I wanna do in my presentation is give you some concrete data and uh, insights into hopefully how you might be able to make that argument for using public life in, in the response to COVID uh, and beyond uh, in, your, in your city and country. So, very quickly, Lasta gave a nice overview of our of our company. The key is is that we work quite globally, and um, have studied public life, how people use streets and spaces in many different climates, many different socioeconomic background um, conditions, uh, and have gathered a lot of input on trying to solve this question about how do we make what is good for you, how do we design for that. So the easy thing is the healthy choice, right? So the easy choice is the healthy one. So designing for our cities and spaces for health and well-being for you as an individual, but also when you use the city, it should also be good for the collective. Easier said than done. Uh, as a design, as a designer and in the design community, we have to also you know think back to 20 years ago where we're still living with design choices that were made after 9-11. After um, you know, you all have lived through very painful experiences at airports. A lot of these decisions to implement this type of airport security was made very quickly uh, after 9-11. And so I think now it's just, the time is actually urgent for us to provide a comfortable, high quality alternative um, to living with the with the pandemic living with living with physical distancing, that's hopefully much more human centered than some of these early responses were. 
The same could also be said for subsequent terrorist attacks in Europe and beyond, uh, where our cities are now filled with physical barriers like this, not the best design solution to supposedly sort of protect us from terror. So if we know that the stakes are high, when big things happen, uh, like pandemics or at wars, we have to actually uh, choose very wisely how to deal with them. And, and for us, the key to making those decisions is actually having data, having real life evidence about what's going on. Uh, that's these areas in the red here, knowing what's happening while cities are in lockdown, uh, also then collecting data again about what's going on as they reopen and then using that information to also hopefully inform longer term strategies. So that's what we've been, we've been doing uh, in, in our work is getting pre and post corona data uh, di digitally through partners like Mapchinair, who you all might be familiar with, uh, asking people about how they use the city before and during. Um, also doing questionnaires uh, like this one here, which we sent out to um, the whole world and, and got a couple thousand responses. And some of the results will also be especially interesting for this group. So we asked these 2000 participants uh, if they've used public space during the pandemic and, and not that much different of a response than what you all said. Um, you, they've used the space a bit more uh, than you all did, uh, but still really, uh, I think, something to ponder about why that might be, right? Because in some cases, it could be because they were closed or it could in a lot of cases be because people don't feel safe. And um, of course, what you see here also in response to this this survey is that it is the very, very essential spaces. It's our neighborhood streets and sidewalks. It's the local neighborhood park. It's these very um, local areas that we might have taken for granted before that now all of a sudden became really vital to our sort of mental and physical well being uh, during the pandemic, but also places where uh, a lot of crowding. Uh, took place where people simply felt like it wasn't uh, safe to use those everyday places. Um, the top reasons to use public space uh, of these 2000 respondees was definitely about exercise, um, followed by relaxation. And I think it's interesting to think about this, you know, typically we'd say the inverse happens in everyday life, right? Most of us, we commute, we run errands, we do all these things we have to do in the city. And the pandemic really turned that upside down, right? So now all of a sudden, if we did go out, we did so for the things that we love to do, uh, like exercise, meet people, meet people, get fresh air uh, and relax. Um, we also saw that actually um, older people felt especially um, maybe both empowered or emboldened <laughs> to use the public realm as uh, for social activity, uh, which I think is interesting, given that, of course, we know old elderly were like more in the risk area. And um, also, I think actually gave an opportunity for a lot of people living alone to ironically, in at least what we found, be feel a, a little bit uh, more connected. So people that typically feel isolated are especially using uh, the public realm. Um, and also, we actually saw a time now, this, this normal, new normal of a lot more walking and cycling, uh, a lot less driving, and of course, a lot less transportation. So one question, of course, is, well, how do we continue on some of these trends? How do we ensure that people that are otherwise isolated can connect? How do we use healthier forms of transportation? How do we make sure people feel comfortable in public space? The other type of data that we collected uh, had to do with observational analysis. So we went out to four Danish cities uh, using um, a digital platform that we've created, the public life uh, data platform that makes it really easy for people in different locations to collect data about what's happening in their streets and spaces through a standardized format. Um, you can see some of the results here that I'm gonna talk about uh, at this website, covid19.gilpeople.com, but I'll go through some of the highlights pretty quickly. Um, so we looked at these four cities, very you know, medium-sized places, 50, 60,000 people populations, and then Copenhagen, the capital, 700,000, um, and found a few trends, right? Some snapshots of what was happening in Denmark in the middle of lockdown. This is all data from the 2nd and 3rd of April, 
we saw um, downtown areas largely deserted. We saw a lot more recreation play and exercise, which I'll come back to. We saw local places. So it is these pocket parks and schoolyards and uh, local, even street corners, you know, being actually seeing more use than before, more people spending time there than, um, than pre-COVID. Uh, we still saw, you know, despite the world being turned upside down, some like point number six here, you know, just general essential human needs of searching for the shade and if it's hot or the sun, if it's cold, um, protection from rain and wind. Hey, you know what, even in, a po in a, even in a COVID world, those things are still important. And we saw new activities popping up and, and, uh, and new user groups, which I'll talk more about. So uh, two things I just want to emphasize here is this idea of local places. So uh, outside the center of Copenhagen, in, in sort of adjacent neighborhoods, we saw either twice as much usage or two and a half times as much usage, um, people spending time, people walking, um, than, than pre-COVID. So this, these two graphs are just the amount of people um, the amount of activities, the amount of activities happening in public space over time, you see throughout the course of the day on the x-axis and the quantity of acti activities on the y-axis. So local life is thriving. Um, and that's, I think, incredibly important lesson to think about going forward. Two other points that I want to really emphasize here is that we saw more e exercise. We saw more play, more outdoor recreation happening than before COVID. So across these three cities in particular, you see the P here is play, uh, amount of activities that were considered play before and during the lockdown in Copenhagen, the amount of exercise before and during the lockdown across these, uh, across these three cities, right? So it, strangely enough in Horsens was the only city that we saw less, um, less play before than, uh, than we did afterwards and exercise went up in, in, in all the places. So this might be, again, familiar in the Danish context. I know this is uh, different depending on where you are, but we saw a lot of kind of typical exercise happening, uh, typical you know, play and physical activity uh, happening, but at increased rates, uh, but also new things popping up, right? So this is in the center of Copenhagen where a lot of the, the, the shops were either closed or people weren't using them for shopping. And now all of a sudden kids had a chance to um, play football in places that they otherwise wouldn't um, skateboard here along the main walking street uh, in Copenhagen as it was empty of shoppers. It was a great place for skateboarders to hang out. Um, at, gy with gyms being closed, we saw, we see a lot more yoga classes and exercise happening in parks. And I don't know if I'd call uh, boule or patang uh, actually physical activity, but still, people getting out, uh, exercising, getting fresh air, meeting one another, um, and other types of, uh, of sports like that. So the other thing we saw is more children um, and elderly, uh, actually as a percentage of folks out in the public realm, and typically a, a, some sort of flip between men and women. So generally across the board, we see more females in public space than before. And we see some trends around how typically women would group in groups of two uh, when they're outside, uh, when they're in the public realm, whereas men would either be alone or in groups of four or five. So again, another interesting uh, sort of new type of behavior uh, brought on by the pandemic. So as I mentioned, you know, seeing kids uh, in places like this where we usually wouldn't see them using the using the public realm in new ways, skateboarding in the fountain, um, you know, still playing music uh, or hanging out in, in a new way, more of this patang. And I mentioned this, I show this because this is typically more of these user groups of, uh, of men and women, right? I'm going quickly because of uh, time. But the, we know that Denmark was a special condition. We know that this wasn't the case in other cities. We would love to, you know, get more of this data in more places. Uh, we did a little bit of this collection in New York and saw very different, very different patterns there. Um, so I think the question is, well, how do we use this 
information um, because now it's about reopening. So how do we gain insight into what's either changed or what's similar, who's there, who's not, uh, to use an evidence-based approach then to, um, to advocate for certain policies, to inform design decisions, to give you know, city leaders hopefully some um, courage to make pretty, uh, pretty bold decisions. Uh, because we know that, you know, saying that people can come out is not the same as really inviting them. Uh, so we have to invite people who are understandably scared to be outside, uh, to be in streets and spaces, but also to do so in a responsible way. So very quickly, just a few themes um, for reopening strategies uh, that we're still grappling with some of these questions. It'd be interesting in the discussion to discuss you know, issues about cultural, culture and cultural institutions. Um, music festivals, markets, gatherings uh, are so important to city life. How do we reimagine them so they can still happen? Um, how do we think about things like the retail sector or access to quality of the public realm? So many elements here that don't, aren't directly related to physical activity, but certainly uh, are part of the equation and hopefully can support, um, support one another. So, so for us, the key is to try to build upon some existing digital services um, to, to make it easier to collect some of this data and information, make it easier to equip um, decision makers with hopefully, you know, our idea here is to have some pretty um, often, you know, collect some of this data and information at regular intervals because things are changing very rapidly. Uh, policies are changing the way that things open up people's, uh, you know, people's perception of if things are safe or not is going to change. So we need to have uh, hopefully um, some continued kind of monthly, bi-monthly uh, registrations. This is what we're suggesting in some of the Danish cities and might be relevant uh, for you all as well. So quickly wrapping, wrapping up, how do we frame elements of public life and physical activity as not only being about health, but also vital for uh, economic recovery, um, can we manage physical distancing uh, in a way that's healthy and responsible? Can we design strategies for moving indoor life outside that's easy enough in the summer, what's going to happen more in the fall and uh, in winter? And then obviously I didn't talk much about it here, but the, the, the hope is that we emerge uh, from, from this crisis stronger than, uh, than we were before. So lots of, uh, I think, you know, general uh, questions, hopefully, and some some data that provides some good food for thought, both for sort of the short-term design guidelines and the and the long-term uh, and the long-term change. And that's I think I'm already over my time, so that's uh, that's all for me. Thank you, Jeff. A uh, very insightful, and I confess that I was one of these two thousand people. Um, uh, taking your survey and great to see the insights and uh, to be honest at what moment I had I had this thought I am losing my job to COVID because for me it seemed that COVID is a better promoter of physical activity than me right. and I'm yeah. and I'm super proud of what we do with the now we move campaign because you know we have the no elevators day and uh, we promote people taking stairs and now I see that many big cities they you know they're special um, like in London, I saw that the people are already being asked to take the stairs, not the elevators, escalators. So um, this is very insightful. Um, and before we go to Simon and Marie, I would ask Maria to play the video from game. And guys, you will like this video because it shows activities in many different places. It was taken back in 2019 before the COVID-19, as Simon put it, situation. I hope you enjoyed the video and then we will listen to Simon and to Marie. Maria?
Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, guys, I don't know if you see maybe Simon, Marie, you can show a little bit of the game. Uh, in 2015, we had ISCA's Move Congress in this absolutely amazing uh, place. And I'm very happy to give the word to Simon and Marie for their presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Laska. I will start out the first five minutes and then I'll pass on to Marie to give us more detail about what we do out on the asphalt. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry for the promo video, but uh, we find that it's a really good way to uh, get people to understand what we actually do. As it also explained, uh, we do really two things. So we uh, don't do much. Marie and I sit at the office because we have 1,000 fantastic role models. We call them playmakers, and they are the ones doing all the activities that you saw in the video. So we help train these uh, role models in 10 different countries in the Middle East, Africa, and in Europe. And then the other thing that we do is we establish public spaces because without any public spaces for sports, then they can't do their work on a weekly basis where they bring the uh, community kits uh, to free weekly street sports practices. Um, so um, public space is uh, something that I uh, believe very strongly in and we're all in game very passionate about both public space and uh, youth leadership. Um, and I think that uh, we need to get back on the streets uh, because of course uh, there's been a COVID-19. We didn't know uh, the mortality rate a few months ago. We do now. We've seen that it's not as dangerous as we feared. We see that the loss of lives is much lower than expected. Uh, right now, I think that the big problem is the loss of uh, lives that we're seeing due to physical inactivity. So very much uh, along the lines of what Moan started out presenting. Um, uh, we know that um, loss of muscle mass, increased fat around the internal organs, insulin resistance, increased level of uh, fat in the blood. These are just some of the scientifically proven consequences of being inactive. And that's not over a year. That's actually over just two weeks. All these uh, uh, things starts to happen and uh, can or will increase the um, the mortality uh, for for some of these uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, so just to put things in perspective, we've heard some of the numbers. We saw Moans' list of what are the, the greatest death causes. Uh, physical inactivity was on there, but what physical inactivity also does is it, it actually uh, it increases the risk of uh, dying from heart disease. Uh, Every year, uh, 57 million people die. Uh, hopefully and luckily, many of those are from natural death causes. But we know that 15 million deaths annually are uh, ascribed to uh, the biggest uh, killer, which is heart disease. So 15 million people die every year from heart disease. Uh, we also know that uh, COVID-19 so far has killed less than 400,000. Uh, partly because we've been really good at keeping a social distance, but uh, this is less than 1% of the total deaths expected in 2019. And if you compare it, the deaths from uh, COVID-19 and the deaths we've seen in these months, uh, the first half year of 2020, it's one person dying from COVID-19 for every 17 people dying from heart disease. And heart disease can be uh, prevented, a lot of it at, at least. Um, so uh, and another uh, great challenge is that uh, we, we see that in high income countries, uh, such as Denmark, but also many of the other countries where we have activities, um, it hits the lower income levels and the ethnic minorities much harder, causing a significant inequality in health. And that's really, really sad. I'm happy uh, that Jeff was uh, able to share some good numbers, I think, about how people have taken the public space uh, back uh, even during the COVID-19 and used it. My fear and what we experienced that uh, Marie will also talk about is that it's the most well-off that uh, take it to the streets. We know that uh, a lot of the uh, people who have the resources to put on their sneakers, tie their shoes, are the ones that are well-educated and have a middle or high income salary. So there's a significant inequality um, in terms of, uh, of, of health when we speak about uh, COVID-19. 
um, and, 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 the, and, and the lack of physical activity. And I'd actually like to uh, pass on to uh, Marie, mm -hmm. because Marie, could you tell us a bit about what are we actually seeing out in the streets and the underserved communities? That would be really interesting, I think, for our yeah. uh, audience here. Definitely. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think it's important to uh, to see that how what one of the things we can see is that COVID-19 is has been kind of a magnifying glass for these inequalities in health that Simon is talking about, which already exist out there. And I think the numbers from from Denmark and the UK clearly shows that people with ethnic minority background who live in poorer neighborhoods are significantly overrepresented when it comes to the infection with the COVID-19. Um, for us, this is not a surprise. Uh, we know that people living in underserved communities have poor health conditions, as, as Simon said. And just within the city of Copenhagen, we have areas where people live six years shorter in average than, uh, than middle class areas. So, um, and, and one of the, the big reasons for this inequality is, of course, the limited access to physical activity. And um, this is, of course, something we, uh, as you also saw in the video, we, uh, we uh, work to improve this access to physical activity for uh, kids and youth in, the, in these underserved communities uh, by utilizing the, the physical space. Um, and, um, and, and I think, as, as, as Simon said, it's, uh, it's really nice. I can see also when I look out the window from where I'm standing right now that a lot of people are using the space just outside here, which was not used very much uh, before. So definitely things are happening in terms of Street, for, street sports being easy because it's it's just out there and you can you can do it without a lot of uh, organization and equipment and so a lot of people uh, um, take this opportunity and this is really something we should build upon but of course we also see that there are other barriers to uh, to to being active and and some of them can uh, can be financial barriers that we know that in not in in not in all countries are as lucky as Denmark to have a, a, a lot of public space accessible in, in Lebanon, for example, where this is definitely not the case. We know that a, a huge number of people, are, uh, even huge, larger number than before, are now not uh, able to do physical activity after COVID-19 at the economic crisis in Lebanon because the, the, even the middle class uh, groups no longer have the money to pay to go to all the, the, the private or semi-private uh, uh, facilities. At the same time, besides the barriers of economy, we also know that, that there are barriers which relate to the, the norms of the participation in, in, in sports clubs and in sports societies, and, and also in, in maybe especially in ethnic minority communities, also like traditions and culture, where, 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 where it's not as, uh, as um, natural to just go out and take in the streets and do sports as it could be for, for, for some of us. Um, and we know from, from our work that it takes a lot of time to we, we use the playmakers who are out there doing activities. They use a lot of time to build trust with kids and families. And, and this can, of course, be a challenge to draw them in again. We, 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 we are starting up activities now. And, and one, some of our concerns is, of course, that some of these kids who have been very far from physical activity is difficult to, to draw in again a group we've had a lot of focus on is, is girls with minority background uh, we know that uh, from 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 the work that we've done to to include more girls that many of the girls feel uh, are, are not inclined to do sport in public they want safe uh, closed spaces and and their parents want them to do sport in in closed spaces so so the the notion of sport moving more outdoors and more in the public can can be a, a big issue for for this group um so this is something we need to have a big focus on so so not just looking out on the streets and seeing that a lot more people are active out there but actually also looking behind that and remembering who's not going out there mm -hmm. the last the group and i, I would like to mention is also the, the the kids and the youth with psychos psychosocial challenges which is a group we've been working a lot with in game where we've been using this lovely house to create safe spaces for for these kids um, many of them are extremely insecure about using their body and being exposed and and suddenly having to go out in in public space is uh, is also uh, something which can uh, which can be move them even further away from physical activity and and even more so with now a big uh, 
an increase in anxiety relating to to illness which uh, which is of course also a big issue for for these kids so we have a priority of being able to open these uh, secure spaces and activities for kids as soon as uh, as possible yeah that that's it for us we almost did it in 12 minutes <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys and that's two of you. Yeah, really important topic and I think what you've mentioned for your uh, the, the group of young people that you work with, uh, we had a recently chat with the Now We Move coordinators and our coordinator from Iceland, Sabina, she shared her thinking that yes, the, the people that were physically active, they're active, but the people who were not active are even more inactive and she was thinking about the elderly uh, the, the elderly people of of, uh, of they they work so it's you know a very complex situation that we have you know with reopening safety and all the m maybe mental issues people have so we had moggins with the political implications we had the data with uh, jeff's research gail's research sorry we had you with the social side of things and i would ask ramon uh, to close this first part of the webinar, like trying to wrap up, uh, because Ramon started um, uh, a, a campaign, post-COVID city, uh, post-COVID-19 city. Um, there's a website and quite a lot of um, networking and activities. Uh, Ramon, could you please share how the future and places will look uh, from your side or from the side of the, the huge network that we work with? Yeah, uh, just a second. Let's see. Can you un unmute yourself? Maria, can you unmute uh, Ramon, please? Marie? Yeah, working on it. Just a second, guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, Ramon, it's yourself muted. So can you please yeah. try to unmute? And no, you're not. Okay. Ah. Hmm. Now can you try can you try just to click the yes now you're on now super okay <laughs> it's so frustrating <laughs> thank <laughs> you for unmuting it I'm unmuting me and thank you for for having me here and closing this this panel of amazing presentations so I'm very happy to share with you that conversation I'm today representing Place Making Europe which is a network of around 400 placemakers, placemakers and city makers of all around Europe that we are involved in knowledge sharing and different uh, working groups, especially we also organize our placemaking week conference. And obviously during the, the last weeks or months already, we've been really uh, worried and focused on what's happening, but moreover about what can we do to avoid uh, I would say certain possible dystopias that are lurking somewhere, no dystopias of fear, control. We were seeing how public life was vanishing uh, in different cities and which were the reactions from different governments and even though uh, the, 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 the characteristics of responses has been differ very different in different countries, we all saw around the globe that this COVID crisis it's been acting as an amplifier mirror for cities. So it's basically a showing in a real, really clear way which are the dysfunctions of different cities and which are actually the cities that are better or can deal better with different crises. And it's especially showing to what extent inequalities are really present in cities. And we are seeing it in terms of housing. So obviously it's not the same to self-isolate in a really well-designed 
comfortable house with your partner than being forced to do the same in a really tiny apartment that you have to share with other five migrant people. We are seeing inequalities in terms of working. So even though uh, teleworking is uh, it's being a solution for certain kind of employees, we are also seeing that that's somehow still a privilege that is certain people that is forced to go to work and also this kind of jobs uh, have certain socioeconomic characteristics and certain bias in terms of gender. And we are also uh, seeing those inequalities in terms of moving. So it is precisely the people that is forced to work, a healthcare workers, a grocery shops, employees and so on, that are forced to go to work. And that also creates tremendous tensions. Now, if you, we think about, for instance, how cities, especially in North America, are shutting down some services related to some public transport services, where, where precisely when they are more necessary than ever, because obviously not everybody can own and should, not everybody should own a car. So considering that, we we decided to launch a manifesto. We've been writing it uh, in a in a in a cooperative way during the last weeks, and around the 23rd of June, we'll publish that manifesto that will be published in 15 different languages at the same time in different 15 uh, journals around Europe. So also, it's a beautiful way to show uh, some cohesion among our diverse geography. That is probably one of the biggest strengths of Europe for, for the future. And starting from that, we will create a platform, a temporary platform, which is called the AfterCovid.CG, to also tell the stories about how cities are reacting, to collect data, and we will finish that as organizing our yearly placemaking week that will be a distributed festival that combine local, offline, and online events, but that will be another story to share. And our main learnings and our main goals is actually to 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 emerge uh, from this crisis in a stronger way, in a more equitable way. And I think that's an opportunity that we cannot miss. And we summarize that in, in 10 main points. And the first of all, and probably the most important one, is that uh, future is a collective construct. We have a word to say and we can shape it. Now they say that the first the, the best way to predict the future is to to, to actually shape it. So it's what, what we want to do, especially in a moment where there are certain things that are sold as inevitable and certainly they are not. So we have agency and we have a word. And for that we think that uh, people and places have a tremendous important world to shape a post-COVID uh, world for the better. Second idea that cities must guarantee a good life for all their citizens, not leaving anyone behind. So there are a lot of experiments that are happening. Spain, luckily enough, last week approved the, 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 the basic income in a temporary way. But we are realizing that there are like there are many tools that 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 can help us to do that. And inclusion, it's more important than ever. Third element, that cities must be an engine for the future of work and the economy. So we are seeing a new kind of jobs emerging, but which is more important, we are probably rethinking and revaluing which are the jobs that make that are actually essential, and those are generally the more feminized work, uh, jobs. There are some certain jobs that were not considered to be um, the, I don't know, the nicest or the most socially respected, and that was a terrible mistake, but now we are seeing how important they are. And also probably we are seeing how, like we might be seeing also the, the obsolescence of CEO, no? Or certain kind of, <laughs> of jobs that are based on meetings, phone calls and social, like I mean, like being attending to meetings, events, and so on. But we're seeing what is important, which is having a nice shop for fresh food, a local market, a nurse, and so on. Third idea that we must rethink health as public good, and in this case, public space and, and physical activity is very, very important because we learn in a really good way that we are inter interdependent. And because the health of one oneself affects the health of the others, we really have to think that as a public good, as public spaces. A uh, next idea that cities must guarantee and increase the access to social infrastructure and public space. So there was 
like many cities, I think committed big mistakes at the very beginning, shutting down playgrounds, parks, and so on. And we realized it's how important it is to maintain physical health and mental health. And it's not only about isolating the people to prevent the virus that can work for a really short time, but not sustainable long term. But also it comes here, the idea of the 15 minute city or however you want to call it, but how important it is to have next to your place a high quality public space, a place to exercise, maybe a co-working space, uh, public facilities, the, the, your, your, your neighborhood doctor and so on. Uh, next idea, uh, cities must opt for better density. In this crisis and as in any other crisis, there are people that predict the end of, of cities, that's not the solution. But also, and, and, and it shows how, how we should design uh, density for the better. Cities must protect and reinforce social proximity during moments of physical distancing. I think we all agree with that. Social distancing has been a terrible concept from the beginning. We can talk about physical distancing, but we have to be together. And also a wide range of community and bottom-up initiative have been flourishing all around the globe, like from, I don't know, doing exercise from your back balcony, uh, rethinking care, rethinking how we can raise kids together and so on. Like everyone became, during this time, not their own company, kindergarten, school, university in with a strong relation with neighborhoods even though with physical distancing uh, cities must take a bold leap forward in enable equity and sustainable society and for me it's important to name that because one of the big answers to that that we are saying in different media is the possibility of a green new deal and if we have a green new deal which is a massive structure investment in green infrastructure in the future that investment should be place based and based on the needs in specific places, we can yeah we can keep talking about that for a long time. But I think it's very important not only to have the, the the consciousness of place and the needs of particular place of territories instead of for just say that invest in a massive way in and I know in, in solar panels and so on that at the end will only benefit specific companies. And if we are picking the concept of New Deal, we also have to bear in mind how how was the original New Deal which is an pro investment program based on local communities that needed work. And as well, it was a, a step, a really strong public step against the monopoly of Wall Street and finance at that moment. So it's important to recognize that. Uh, and the last two, uh, cities must reinvigorate the culture that makes them drive. So we are talking about music venues, museums, street shops, and so on. It's very, very important to maintain and protect the street life, uh, a street life on the downtown. And finally, which is quite interesting, is that cities can implement now temporary tactical actions that can be aligned to broader transformative goals. And we are seeing obviously a bunch of tactical urbanism examples of expanding uh, bike lines and so on that probably will create changes that will stay forever. But what we are seeing as well at the moment is temporary social rights as well. So there are many cities in the world that are stopping evictions for a while. They're providing solutions for homeless people and so on. So we should make sure with the, where our words and agency that we, we, we make that lasting as well, because it's proven that there is economic and political possibilities to avoid having the people living on street or, or having the pressure of not having a roof. So those new rights should stay forever. And that's it. That's what I wanted to share with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. That was uh, quick, insightful, 10 steps. Great. And we can have an access to these 10 steps when the website is up, right? Yeah, two weeks, in two weeks. Super. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you to all the panelists. And now I would uh, ask my colleague Rachel to show herself. And also I would ask all the presenters to also show themselves on the video um, as uh, we are starting our panel discussion. Yes, we are all here um, and I've, I was following the questions and uh, the chat panel. So please continue sending your questions. Rachel has them. So thank you again. And Rachel, please. Ah. OK. 
okay. Yes, excellent. Okay, thanks everyone. And like Laska said, we've, we've heard some different perspectives from yeah, the, the political side and to building a convincing argument to uh, promote public space, especially in raising awareness uh, among governments as well. Um, yeah, the social aspects and how we can sort of push this agenda forward. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that we, we received in advance. I've got one from Elizabeth from Canada. And she says, she, she actually talks about the power of the people and sort of um, how uh, the public can use social capital to engage uh, in leisure in public spaces. So how can we have a sort of bottom-up movement coming from all of this? Because this situation has been quite an equaliser, I think, for a lot of us. So, yeah, um, I guess that would, could be a question maybe for Ramon or Jeff. Yep, you go. <laughs> there we go. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think for us, we think about this data that we're collecting, um, going out and quantifying uh, who's in the city and who's not there, what types of things are happening, is one way to, to make people count, so to speak. So our hope is that, that it exactly is that sort of making people and their needs visible. Uh, and it's especially challenging as, um, as Simon and uh, Ramon also mentioned in terms of you know, low income and vulnerable communities. But our hope is that, you know, can we, by, by collecting some of those data is a short answer, that's the first step. And, and essentially building from there for the groundwork for more adv advocacy and uh, opportunities for that ground up sort of swell to take place. I actually have another question uh, for you, Jeff. Uh, uh, Mariam was asking about uh, the reasons behind women using public space more than men during this crisis. Yeah, super interesting. And, and you know, this is what we've published so far is just the first part of our work. Um, we're now looking at these four cities again, now that um, the country's opening up uh, to see if we can get some more insight into that, um, getting some questionnaires and interviews to also find out. I think so far, all we have is sort of anecdotal and maybe somewhat traditional stereotypes of men and women where, where women might be better at planning, easy for them to, you know, plan a meeting with a particular friend and therefore meet up both in the groups that we saw in groups of two and also to sort of more proactively um, be in the public realm. So that's one thing. And another thing might be, again, stereotypically about females, more health conscious, sort of more aware of um, needing to take care of themselves uh, and, and thereby also wanting to, uh, to be outside more. Again, those are just things that we've talked about hypothetically, but hopefully we'll have some more data and insights to speak more concretely to that super interesting question. Mm -hmm. And connected to that, I'd ask uh, Simon and Marie, because uh, you do accommodate hard to reach girls and women, and you have this lovely big dance studio at the back of, of game. And I'm just wondering what kind of steps you're taking to accommodate this group and making this indoor space safer so they can participate behind closed doors if necessary. Thanks for the question. Uh, just just to start out uh, with uh, why we see more women in public space than men, uh, we, we think that uh, it has something to do with the preferred sports for men, which is often ball sports where you are several people uh, together. Those have not been allowed during the lockdown, so you've not been able to play football, uh, you know, 14 people together. So th that's probably part of the reason that there's a, a different uh, a preference for sports, whereas more women do yoga and you can do your yoga mat and many yoga studios have been really good at moving out into the parks and running the classes out there. 
Uh, in terms of what we do, there was a very interesting uh, webinar last week about uh, indoor facilities mm -hmm. uh, hosted by ISCA. Um, <laughs> so we're in the middle of the process right now. We're waiting for the guidelines because officially you're not allowed to do indoor sports yet in Denmark. Uh, so we're waiting for the authorities' guidelines on what will uh, be the, the restrictions, limitations. But we're expecting that we will have to draw more lines uh, around uh, and, and have no more than 10 people on each uh, with each within each group, but uh, be able to do more than one group under the same roof. So uh, dividing up this way is definitely part of what we're going to be doing in Denmark, for sure. But we also try to, if I should supplement to, when we go out to the to the city areas where we work, where our playmakers do activities, we also challenge with not being able to move indoors, which is often what the girls uh, want to feel safe. But we try to, in, in collaboration with people, working there to find outdoor safe spaces, like can we find small spaces where you can feel more safe and more enclosed, which you can use, but which is still outdoors. So this is also a way of there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also thought connected to that as well, we, at the moment, the crisis has sort of come in the spring months or summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, at least um, in the winter months, it could be a challenge if we have say a second or third wave of the virus and how can we respond to that and how will that have an impact on, on the use of public space, do you think? I don't know, Ramon, you want to go? No, I think it's very, it's very, 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 very difficult to, to predict what's going to happen. And yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm brave enough to say anything, but I think that what we learn is we really need to protect the public realm. And that's linked as well with the question that we were sharing before. So let's say, for instance, I have data of my city in Valencia and, um, and, and the, the data that we have, for instance, for public transport is that uh, around 70% of people that was taking the subway in peak hours were women. And that was the reason was especially that there are like the, the, the essential jobs that I said, nurses, care works and so on are extremely feminized. So that's one thing. But we learn with that is that if we have decided to shoot up uh, public transport, that would have, have a really uh, a terrible inequality impact. And I, I would say that whatever we do to protect public realm, we have to take that into account. So it's not only about exercising, it's about moving, it's about uh, having the necessary social infrastructure, it's about men mental health. But I think we learn now that probably a super strict lo lockdown, it won't be totally necessary anymore. So we do have to rely in personal responsibility and also maintain fundamental human rights. So I'd say that probably we are, I'm not sure if physically or like we are more ready, but I think at least intellectually we are more ready because we learn a big deal from this this past couple of months. Uh, I've also got a question from Anna from Sweden, and she's organising Mobility Week later in the year. So uh, we're thinking about ways of connecting these initiatives that promote the use of public space and things like ISCA's Open Streets Day, Mobility Week, European Week of Sport. Uh, she's trying to plan ahead for that, but she wants to know what types of activities she can plan and sort of planning for a plan A, plan B scenario. What, what would you suggest as types of activities that would be suitable for public space? If I may try to answer that, uh, then I, I think uh, our, our argument and I think what we heard from Moans also is let's not uh, continue overreacting. Let's get back to uh, something more normal. Uh, I, I loved your picture, Jeff, with the uh, post uh, uh, seven, uh, 9 11. Uh, that, you know, let's avoid that 20 years from this, uh, we're still not participating mm -hmm. in sports uh, yeah. touching each other. Uh, there, there's no wrestling, there's no, you know, uh, maybe we take out the high five and do the elbow instead. I mean, I'm fine with that, but but I think it would be, you know, <laughs> it would be a massive number of uh, early deaths and also reduced life quality if we take away physical activity in the public space. And the public space is so important because it's so visual. It's one of the, actually, with our activities in game in the Middle East, 
the public space is what we put first in all the applications because that is how you show that girls can actually play sports because there are so many girls who don't think that sports mm -hmm. are for them. But by putting girls out in public space, showing that you can actually do it, maybe you don't want to do intimate things like dancing and yoga, but you know, you can play football, you can play basketball in the public space where everyone comes because everyone has access to the asphalt is so important and fundamental in order to promote physical activity. So I hope uh, Anna from Sweden will, you know, maybe do away with the mm. wrestling this summer, mm. but, you know, make sure to have lots of football games and, and, and other good things. And then a hand sanitizer and some information about how to cough, but leave it at that. That's enough. May I comment, comment a couple of things? Because it, it's true that we learn also that obviously being outside, it's safer that, that being inside. So we, so it's good to be outside, not only because we're breathing fresh air, but also in terms of, of, of preventing the transmission of virus. And we actually have been observing extraordinary things happening. In the, during during the last month, so I've seen the Muslim community praying outdoors and celebrating outdoors the end of Ramadan, for instance. So it's civilizing a collective that a collective that is a community that is not much visible at least here in Spain. But we've seen people in streets like kids playing ball, tennis, for instance. I'd like a fantastic picture of a, of a street in London in Notting Hill with like, people with just with a net playing tennis. And, and we've seen that kids recover in public spaces have, have never happened. No? So it's been also an interesting exercise to see cities full of public life while the, 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 the shops were closed. And also we've seen main streets that were recovered by pedestrians just enjoying the outdoors. So what I say is like, let's, I say, like, I will insist on that. Let's not waste this opportunity and make those, that extraordinary things the new normal. Yeah, and about that opportunity as well, it must be quite an opportunity for placemaking in general to also gain more awareness and convince more governments that they need to open up more urban spaces for people. So how do you think in mm -hmm. the medium to long term this will impact your work? Uh, to, uh, I think that we are now kind of sitting on a crossing, and it's true that we see what you were mentioning. Also, you know, we could see the consequences of that staying for long term. So it means more restrictions to travel, more controls at the airport, um, less quality urban design. We maybe imagine that cities just take out benches or paint playgrounds because that's a, that could be a danger, and that would be terrible. But I'd say uh, this is a big opportunity. I I, I hope that we together can shape that and we will we, 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 we'll see that affecting other aspects that are important to, to daily life for instance it's education so we could see the schools for instance teaching in the outdoors we can see the walls of the of the playgrounds or the recreation area around schools tear down and become as well uh, community infrastructure at a neighborhood level so i'm actually i don't know i'm really optimistic I do think that, as I say, those extraordinary things that can make us win the battle, uh, but we really, really have to be strong and, and convince everyone. I'll just, I'll just plug in there quickly. I think I, I appreciate your optimism, Ramon. I think there's also a sense of urgency for the city leadership and, and design communities. Um, Cause I think if I'm, if I'm honest and also critical, um, also for ourselves, I mean, I think that there's been a, a tendency to sort of respond with like our existing bag of tricks. So to say, oh, some changes in the city are happening. Let's do some tactical urbanism uh, initiatives, close some streets, create some bike lanes. And I think that's all good, but I don't think it's actually enough. And it's not responsive enough to, you know, the health issues that Moans pointed out the inclusion and cultural issues that Simon and Marie pointed out, the uh, you know the issues that Ramon pointed. So I think I think we actually have to like raise the ambition a little bit and and use that overused cliche about like sort of never wasting a crisis to to not just accept projects that we had in the drawer and then we put out, but actually to like really uh really raise the ambition and you know it's a it's a 
it, that we have to hold each other accountable uh, for, I think, raising the ambition level higher. Well, you can say on the one hand that the crisis has caught governments off guard, but on the other hand, some of them, we have seen some proactivity uh, in closing streets and op opening them for pedestrians and for cyclists. Uh, as things slowly come back to normal, how can we sort of convince these governments, especially we have Vienna, we have Budapest, we have Bogota, which already has quite a strong tradition in this, but how can we kind of convince them to keep these sorts of initiatives going and is it at all possible or viable for the future? I think I'll jump in there, just two, two thoughts. I mean, it, it's not going to be easy, like at all. Uh, city governments are gonna be really tight on cash uh, and it will be, I think, easier to, um, to do just the status quo or to, 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 to not continue these initiatives uh, after things come a little bit back to normal, there'll be economic issues, right? So, so I think it's probably our job to tie more explicitly issues of health, physical activity, inclusion. I think we have to tie those better to economic issues uh, than we have in the past. So, so it can, so this approach can be intrinsic in economic development, can be part of community development. Uh, I know we all sort of think like that and have tried it in the past, but I think to 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 be successful in this case, when resources are even more constrained, uh, we'll have to make our agenda more in line with the city's agenda, rather than expecting them to sort of uh, take on board uh, our agenda, if that makes sense. And how can the economic impact from this uh, affect the use of public space as well? Uh, we can see there could be businesses closing on squares where people might gather and perhaps turning cities into ghost towns, or you could have people who can't afford to join in activities anymore. So do you think there would be a direct economic impact, impact from this crisis as well? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. If I make comments, uh, I would like uh, COVID-19 to go away and back to new normal. Or normal. But I think we have to be aware of that whatever we do in our sector for the next couple of years, it will have a nickname. And the nickname will be COVID-19. So we have to try to be a visible solution. And maybe we are not uh, in time to be a visible solution for this round of viral diseases. But uh, at the end of it, it's important to make sure that you become a part of the solutions next time, similar or less, or whatever hits us. Because this round, politicians went into a mode of we don't know what to do. We do a lot. We have never tried it before and nobody wants to be whatever ranking higher on death. So, so there was some kind of uh, understandable panic. Uh, right now there is a lot of noise out there and if you don't say COVID-19, I don't think you are hurt. So even though we would like it to be normal, I think we, we have to say, show ourselves how to be a visible solution. And we will have to put the nickname uh, solution to COVID-19 uh, for a long time. Uh, so if we do not be solution in this round, try to put you in position. That's the first question from Canada. By using the crowd and the citizen as much as possible because the crowd, as Steve told us, has shown us. It was very encouraging to show us that, for example, seniors, most vulnerable, it looks like in your data, Jeff, that uh, social hunger beat fear. Even though they are the most vulnerable, they want to go out and socialize. So, so we have some crowd perspective here that can sort of say pave the way for another decision making or another type of lockdown for the next time. Rachel, may I? Yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah. 
there's a really interesting conversation. We are just uh, very close to our ending. A very interesting uh, question from Rafaela from WISP Italy. And she, um, she starts with a comment. I wonder if there's any other experience on advocacy towards cities, regional governments and national governments in Italy. Um, you know, they have been really hard hit uh, and they have been developing campaigns and advocacy with, for example, with Emilia Romagna. Um, and I don't know if I say that right. Uh, regional claiming for the establishment that's a long one for the establishment of roles and measures to restart open centers for children. To uh, they signed WISP, signed agreements, and participate in open and open tables uh, by organized by the local authorities. Um, and the question is, what could be the advocacy measures? What could be additional advice from you guys for all the organizations that try to work with uh, their governments? I know that there was a previous question like that, but what could be like uh, final words to, uh, to, to our listeners and our participants? Sorry, can I uh, come with a suggestion? I, I think this uh, is very similar to the one we just uh, debated. And, and I think if, if Jeff's uh, argument was that we should try and uh, tie the argumentation up to an economic perspective, that's ultimately what politicians will listen to. Uh, I, I think it would be very interesting to use Moan's argument uh, where we have only been reacting to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We haven't been discussing how to prevent it. Mm -hmm. So I would love for ISCA or another organization to put some money or find some funding for doing a survey, looking at what does it mean to be physically active? Uh, we know that it's uh, strengthening your uh, immune system, but what is it in the light of COVID-19? Uh, what was the activity levels of the ones being hard hit by COVID-19 and going into intensive care opposed to the ones uh, uh, being physically active? So. Looking at that, maybe that could be a way to advocate for more physical activity. Because if we can make that connection and say, if you're physic, if you're physically active, you have, you will have so much less of a chance of uh, going into intensive care if you get the virus. So I, I think that would be a, a feasible way to, to, to make it um, a, a strong advocacy uh, route. Thank you, thank you, Simon. I love that idea. Up. Plus one, uh, plus one on that, Simon. I realise I've missed a couple of questions because I wasn't getting the notification popping up. But we have a couple of interesting ones also from Fiona from Ireland. Um, she says, on the one hand, how can we connect globally to gather big data on physical activity engagement during COVID-19? And she also talks about creating a multi-stakeholder group and how, how can we sort of pull our different sectors together uh, to get the end users to engage in human-centred innovation. We need, we need all good ideas. Uh, we need all uh, data that's available and uh, I think uh, maybe Jeff and, and Hamon is uh, better in where they come from. Uh, mobility data is a good argument. And also on the second part, uh, how to be very, very creative on the this uh, particular phase, what, how to be very creative in the future solutions. I think we have to go uh, the way Simon uh, introduced. We have to be part of the visible solution and we have to call it by the name COVID-19. I'm sorry, I would like to disappear, but for a couple of years, this is the solution that we have to solve. Uh, Laura has a question uh, from Estonia, one of our ISCA colleagues, and uh, she has a question about some of the innovations that have been in introduced during this crisis uh, to uh, allow for more physical activity and uh, or to, related to public space. And will these sort of endure? Will these endure and stay uh, for another 20 years? What, what will we see in 20 years' time uh, from this crisis? Mayet? 
No. Can, can you listen to me? Okay. No, I, I, I must confess that I'm an economist and we are the economists, we are terrible predicting, even though we show off sometimes and we said everyone that we have like really good predictions, but that's never the case. So we we really don't know. And as I said, it would be good if we shape it that collectively and also if we give some strength and power to different activists all around the world. But what, what I really guess, and I think it can happen if we take bold ideas, and I totally agree with Jeff that we have to be bolder. It's not only about parklets, it's not only about tactical urbanism. So that's that shouldn't like that's the right moment to do some structural changes. I'm here, I'm also thinking about the economic structure our lives are embedded in. So from global logistics to the supply chain of the goods that we need our everyday life. So it makes makes much more sense to produce food locally and so on, you know that. But one of my predictions would say that it's, it's, it's both a dream and a prediction, but I, I hope that that creates a big push to enjoying investing and, and, and using more in a different and diverse way to the, the outdoors. So I do think that the outdoors might be the next urban revolution. Okay. Um, there's a follow-up question from Anna from Sweden, and uh, of course a concern in organising big events is uh, crowds and accommodating and managing crowds. So uh, I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about that and how how you might manage this in the future, and maybe Simon and Marie might know from your events. So yeah, well we haven't had any haven't events had uh, during COVID. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, my uh, grocery uh, shop on, uh, in Copenhagen on Nørrebro, what they have done is they have made it very visible by taking some pallets and uh, put them upside down and say only one uh, at the, you know, at the squash, only one at the tomatoes at a time. And I, and I think really, you know, physical structures that uh, tells you that, you know, this is the number of people where you're allowed inside this, you know, that everyone understands that everyone wants to avoid getting a COVID-19. So if you can physically make boxes uh, smaller or larger and, you know, not too many people, then, then I think uh, you can manage it in a good way. But I think for the remainder of 2020, we will see uh, special restrictions also like Moans uh, 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 looked at, that we, we talk about the short term and the long term. And I think for the short term uh, events that has the potential of gathering bigger crowds, will not uh, be done, that will be in the longer term. Yeah. But maybe Just also an option of, of rethinking your concept of a big event, because sometimes a big event can be smaller events happening in different places at the same time. Or So it's also, there is a ways of doing bigger events, which is not necessarily gathering a thousand people in the same spot. So this might also be a way of uh, innovating a bit on the way we do events. Exactly. I, I was going to say the, exactly the same thing. And I think that's an example of how we actually need to change our mindset. Right. So if one change of mindset is, you know, very much about prevention rather than um, recovery, uh, like Simon and Marie said. And then this also point, I think distributing events, uh, we know this this point that I also mentioned in our data that local areas and some of this, you know, the local neighborhood is is just more important and i think that's going to be more important in the future more people working from home um at least a couple days a week uh, it's going to dramatically change the sort of dynamics and importance of of local neighborhoods and big events that are distributed to different parts of of the city uh, mm -hmm. in some small locations where otherwise before people thought oh we won't do that event uh there we have to hold it in the center of the city uh, I think distributing networks of people, rearranging um, is is really the the next iteration. I think maybe the physical barriers are going to be needed. That could be the first one. But I think exploding the physical constraints uh, and creative solutions for that, I think, will be the next uh, the next wave. Okay, we have one last one from Saudi Arabia, actually, and they ask, uh, how can we overcome the social stigma associated with going to public places and how can governments 
uh, alter users' perception of urban spaces? That's a really good question because uh, what we have faced now is a lot of uh, regulations, like uh, physical limitations. But I fear that when the physical li uh, limitations are gone, we will still have this uh, psychological limits and we will not be aligned. Some will say, I'm ready to shake hands, say goodbye, uh, hi, and do uh, whatever play football and others will be more reluctant. So we have really, really a uh, need of creative communication solution so that we sort of say, if not align ourselves, all of us on the same level, then know what the other expects. Because otherwise the soft limitations, uh, the fear uh, might stay longer than uh, the physical limitations. And I think exactly that is a good comparison with 9-11 because we are still having physical limitations but where are the the, the soft uh, the fear uh, here i think we have need of very much creativity to get back and avoid stigmatization i have something to add as well um, so I, I i think this is super interesting especially with the question coming from saudi arabia uh, because there are uh, several places uh, out there where we see a tendency to not go back to the normal and allow crowds to gather. Uh, we see it in Lebanon, where a game has been active for 12 years. Um, they had they had an uprising that started in, in October last year. Uh, people started going back into the streets uh, after the curve was broken for the COVID-19. What happened? The authorities reimposed a curfew and they said it was due to COVID-19 because they didn't want people in the streets protesting. So I think we have to be really, really aware that, that there's a high risk that we will not be able to gather and assemble in the same way as we have before. Not in Europe, but, but in other parts of the world where uh, there's not a long uh, tradition for democracy. Uh, so we really, really have to, uh, to take back the streets. I think this is super important. Uh, for for many reasons, and um, and 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 I think uh, the good thing, the good thing is that the people on this call actually have power to to uh, to argue and 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 make a change and help more uh, citizens get back into the streets. So unlike the 9/11, where it was the authorities uh, imposing uh, the harsh uh, security measures in the airports then the people in this call actually have a voice and a choice in order to get people back in the streets. Thank you. Jeff, come on. Maybe that's a good way to end. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks everyone. And I'll, I'll hand back to Alaska now. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Morgan, Simon, Marie, Jeff, and uh, Ramon uh, for being panelists uh, and sharing your insights with the public. I hope the audience also found what they were looking for and have their two uh, pieces of paper filled with ideas. I thank you again, um, and I wish you a very good evening. I was very happy preparing this uh, webinar, and I'm really, really happy of, of what we achieved tonight. So thank you so much and have a great evening. And cheers and a glass of wine. <laughs> thank, thank you, you all. all. Thank Bye. you. Thank you for participating, guys. And thank you for our questions. Bye. Bye.